Hello, welcome to another episode of Some PLA OSINT, where we take a look at recent news on the People's Liberation Army. Note that I no longer name these videos using calendar weeks because there's no way I can keep up with the speed of major developments, especially on the weapons programs of the PLA. So the topic I am covering in this video is not freshly out of China, but with a few weeks lag. Nevertheless, I wish to cover them with sufficient details and some thoughtful commentaries. In this video, I will talk about the Chinese carrier-borne flying wing armored combat aircraft, the GJ-21, and put it into perspective among other similar Western UCAF programs, especially the American ones. Then, in the second story, we will come back to manned aircraft talking about the first flight of a new advanced fighter trainer which is rumoured to be the future workhorse pumping out PLA carrier aviators. I will go a bit deeper to talk about the status quo of available trainers of the PLA carrier air wings and the future development that contrasts the ongoing US procurement program in the same area. Now, let's dive into the first story. What we are looking at here is a prototype of the GJ-21 flying. The GJ-21 is a navalized version of the GJ-11 UCAF. We have already seen the aircraft displayed during the VJ Day Parade in early September this year, but it was a ground display as it was mounted on a truck. From this screen grab from the parade livestream, we can see the foldable wings, which are the telltale sign of carrier adaption. On each wing, there are three control surfaces. The wings and control surfaces are the most apparent distinguishing factors between the PLA Navy's GJ-21 and its Air Force sibling, the GJ-11. Here we can see the GJ-11 featured in the promotion video made for the PLA Air Force anniversary in November. We can see two control surfaces on each wing and one on each side of the fuselage next to the engine exhaust. This is different from the GJ-21's configuration with all control surfaces on the wings. As a carrier-specific airframe, the GJ-21 should have a significantly larger wing area and larger control surfaces to increase lift and maneuverability at low speed. The new image of the GJ-21 offers us a look at its belly. Here we can see the tail hook used for arrest landing is released and there seems to be an additional control surface in front of the tail hook. From this graph, extracted from a Chinese research paper, this control surface serves as additional air brakes to help the aircraft slow down for landing. Since the primary carrier of the GJ-21, the Type 076 amphibious assault ship has only just started its sea trial. It will take a few years for the ship and the aircraft to be fully operational. But with a clear path to induction and low rate initial production likely started, the GJ-21 is at the most advanced stage compared to similar projects elsewhere, despite far from being the first mover. Let's have a recap on the other programs aiming to create a flying wing UCAF by Western nations. Here, we can see that the US was the absolute leader early on, being the first to launch such programs that yielded full-scale tech demonstrators or prototypes. Boeing Phantom Works X-45A first flew in 2002. Not only did it precede any other similar aircraft elsewhere, but also had an almost 10-year lead compared to other American projects. Almost a decade later, in 2011, Boeing's own X-45C and Northrop Grumman's X-47B had their first flights. The flying wing UCAF space had now become more crowded, with European and then Chinese players entering the game. In 2012, Dassault's Neuron first flew. In the next year, 2013, BAE Systems Taranis took to the sky in August, representing the UK's entrance, and three months later, China's Aviation Industry Corp flew its sharp sword tech demonstrator, which eventually evolved into the GJ-11 and GJ-21 that we are talking about today. Among these various projects, only the X-47B and the later GJ-21 are designed and built to take off and land on aircraft carriers. Boeing did propose a carrier-borne version of the X-45C, designated as X-45N, but it lost against the X-47B, hence was never built. Both the X-45C and X-47B were developed to meet the requirements of the Joint Unmanned Combat Air Systems program for a base design that will branch into a version for the US Air Force, 
and another for the US Navy, much like the Joint Strike Fighter Program, aka the F-35. From this slide published in 2005 on the weapons loadout of the future X-47B, the US was very ambitious on the variety of combat missions it should be able to execute, ranging from precision strike to air-to-air -air combat and suppression of enemy air defense. We can see the airframe was overlaid against both the Air Force F-35A and the Navy's F-A-18. Yet, Norse Grumman's X-47B did not fare too much better than Boeing's X-45N. Despite achieving multiple milestones such as the first carrier launch and landing of such an unmanned aircraft, the first simultaneous carrier activities of manned and unmanned aircraft, etc., the test program was concluded without follow-up development. As the US Navy became progressively less ambitious about defining how unmanned aircraft would operate within carrier air wings, the X-47B type UCAVs, which are very stealthy, highly autonomous, designed to prioritize strike missions in highly contested or even denied airspaces, fell out of favor. The unmanned carrier launched aerial surveillance and strike or U-class program that followed was only required to conduct light strikes for counter-terrorism operations and surveillance in basically undefended or very lightly contested airspace. The requirements for this program produced proposals such as the Sea Avenger unmanned aircraft from General Atomic with slightly more conventional drone designs. But the U-class program was deemed too ambitious for the US Navy going into the late 2010s. In the end, what the US Navy wants as the primary mission for its first operational carrier based on an aircraft, the MQ-25 Stingray, is to deliver 15,000 pounds or about 7 metric tons of fuel 500 nautical miles from the carrier to other manned aircraft. From US Navy's requirements, strike capabilities are mostly thrown out of the window, while surveillance capabilities are significantly downgraded. Okay, enough about what the US has done, going back to China's PLA. Recall this image about the weapon loadout of the X-47B. We can see four small diameter bombs can be carried inside one weapons bay on either side of the aircraft. And compared to this mock-up of the GJ-11 showcased in an airshow, we can see that the GJ-11 carries the same loadout. This puts the GJ-11 to roughly the same size as the X-47B and possible very similar mission profiles. Here, we can see a level of irony. With the GJ-11 and GJ-21 entering service, at the end, it is the PLA that realizes the JUCAS program envisioned by the US Department of Defense in the early 2000s. But the PLA didn't stop here. It also took a look at the U-class program and said, I want that as well. Here, in another research paper published, we can see another model simulating a carrier landing of a conventional medium UAV. This is very likely the carrier-adapted version of China's Wing Long 10, which is already in service with the PLA Air Force. And there's also this one. We don't know if this one actually exists, but if it does, it sure can contest the fat Amy on chubbiness. The second story is also related to the PLA Navy's carrier aviation. The first prototype of an advanced fighter trainer took to the sky in the late October and early November. This airframe is rumored to be the next generation trainer for the PLA Navy's carrier air wings. One of the most prominent features of this aircraft is the large leading edge extensions. These extensions function as large vortex generators, which create spinning low pressure air that sticks on the wing surface under conditions that air without vortices normally would not. This helps the aircraft to maintain lift in high angle of attack maneuvers and makes the aircraft significantly more maneuverable. We can find large leading edge extensions on the FA 18s. By overlaying an FA 18 with the new Chinese fighter trainer, we can see some level of similarities. This is why this new aircraft is nicknamed Super Small Hornet by Chinese defense enthusiasts. That said, large leading edge extension is a feature almost ubiquitous to fourth generation fighters. We can see the feature on various different designs, such as the F-16 and the Su-27 family. 
Interestingly, the new aircraft also incorporates some features from fifth generation fighters. We can see the nose section is designed with sharp edges to better deflect enemy radar signals, overlaying it with the PLA's J-35 carrier-based fifth generation fighter. We can see beveled vertical stabilizers on both aircraft, pointing design inspirations. There's not much more that we know about this aircraft, but I'd like to use this opportunity to go over the status quo of jet trainers used by the PLA Navy for its carrier air wings. And like the US-China comparison I did for UCAVs earlier in this episode, I'd also put up one for the ongoing procurement efforts on both sides for naval jet trainers. What we are looking at here is a Chinese JL-9G trainer landing on a mock carrier landing strip painted on the ground. The JL-9G trainer is a MiG-21 on steroids, and even though it is designed to train carrier-based fighter pilots, it lacks the features such as reinforced landing gears, tail hooks to perform actual takeoff and landing on an actual carrier. Before pilots earn their certification to take off and land at sea, they must go through rigorous training using land-based facilities. So the JL-9G is just designed for that. We can see in this footage that trainees from the PLA Navy's Naval Aviation University are performing touch and go with the aircraft on land. Currently, the JL-9G is the only trainer in service at scale that is dedicated for carrier aviation training. The PLA Navy doesn't seem to be satisfied with just land-based training. Here, we can see an example of the GL-9G performing a wave-off on one of Chinese carriers at sea. Apart from the GL-9G, the PLA Navy also employs other jet trainers. A growing number of GL-10 advanced jet trainers have been added to the ranks of the PLA Navy. In this shot, we can see 12 JL-10s being inducted at the same time. But these aircraft are used for training land-based aviators for the most part. For the full training experience of launching and landing on a carrier, the twin-seater version of the J-15 heavy fighters is needed. This is clearly a sub-optimal solution, as using a full-fledged twin-engine heavy fighter just to get new pilots to train on basic flight operations is extremely wasteful. That is why it is a very rare occasion that I haven't found any image of. The PLA continues its quest for a carrier-based jet trainer. As more carriers are coming through the construction pipeline, the training pipeline for carrier-based pilots must also follow. This image shows the new carrier Fujian when it was still in the shipyard. Various mocks-ups of members of its air wings were brought onto the flight deck. This includes a modified JL-10 trainer. We can see the nose landing gear is significantly reinforced. Additionally, a launch bar can be seen on the nose landing gear, indicating this aircraft is capable of being launched with a catapult. And in this image, we can see an actual airframe of the modified JL-10 is flying. Let's call it the JL-10T for now. Again, for such a grainy image, we can still make out the beefy nose landing gear and the launch bar attached. This leads us back to the new fighter trainer that we talked about earlier. Compared to the JL-10T, the nose landing gear of the new aircraft seems to be significantly fragile for carrier operations. From grapevine sources on Chinese social media, this fighter trainer could be the Air Force model of a joint program that will eventually produce a carrier-based version. We will find out in the future. Interestingly enough, the US Navy is also in the process of replacing its current carrier-based trainer, the T-45C Goshawk. From this image, we can see a T-45C has just landed on a US carrier. Tail hook, reinforced landing gears, catapult launch bar, features that are essential for operating from a carrier are all present on this aircraft. The Goshawk was first inducted in 1991. It can be considered relatively new, especially if we look at the US Air Force. Its main jet trainer, the T-38 Talon, was first inducted in 1961, and the development of its replacement, the T-7A Red Hawk, is still ongoing. But given how the T-45 has been extensively used for carrier-based training, and taking off and landing on a carrier are significantly more unforgiving for the airframe. The replacement program, 
named Undergraduate Jet Training System, has already started. In this program, major US defense contractors are taking foreign designs, further developing them to fit US requirements. Here are the contenders. TF-50N, jointly offered by Korean Aerospace Industries and Lockheed Martin. T-7, jointly offered by Saab and Boeing. Freedom Trainer, jointly offered by Turkish Aerospace Industries and Sierra Nevada Corporation. M346N, jointly offered by Leonardo and Textron Aviation. This list covers aircraft originally made across Europe and Asia with both single-engine and twin-engine designs. With base aircraft that already have extensively operation history like the T-50 and M346, and those that are still undergoing development, such as the T-7. But there's one fundamental thing that they all have in common. Since the US Navy waived the requirement for being able to complete a full cycle of launching and landing on a carrier, these aircraft are all going to be strictly land-based. This decision by the US Navy has been controversial since day one. So just in terms of carrier worthiness, the US Navy will actually get a downgrade from the full carrier capable T-45 to the next generation trainer that is only required to be able to conduct simulated takeoff and launching on land-based facilities and perform touch and go on carriers. This is at the same level of the Chinese JL-9G, which is likely on the way out, while the incoming trainers of the PLA Navy are designed to provide pilots trainees the full carrier experience. I want to be very clear here that the US Navy is still the absolute leader in carrier operations in terms of experience, scale, and sheer capabilities. But many decisions were made in the past two decades that seems to be more conservative on taking technical and operational risks, pushing boundaries, spearheading global trends. And during the same time, a challenger appeared, meticulously imitating learning from the US Navy. And we're now at an inflection point that the disciple is progressing faster than the master in certain areas. To close off today's episode, I am thinking about making a Patreon exclusive video on the history of Chinese carrier program. My initial plan is to release it within January 2026. If you are interested and wish to support this channel, please go to my Patreon page linked in the description. Thank you and see you in the next video.